welcome students, honored guests, and viewing audience. I'm Mike Sadomka, the principal of Humboldt High School, and it's a pleasure to have you here. It's my pleasure to introduce Chief Justice John Guthman of the Second Judicial District. Chief Judge Guthman has served as a Minnesota District Court bench since 2008. He has been Chief Judge of the District since 2016. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Cornell College, his Juris Doctorate, and his Juris Doctorate from William Mitchell College of Law. Prior to his tenure on the district court bench, he worked as an attorney, partner, and managing partner at Hanson, Dordell, Brandt, Aulog, and Brandt, PLLP, from 1981 to 2008. Chief Judge Guthman serves on the Minnesota Judicial Council, the policy-making board for the Minnesota Judicial Branch. He's also currently co-presiding judge of the Ramsey County Mental Health Court and previously served as a lead judge for the Minnesota asbestos litigation. Judge Guthman is also a recipient of the 2015 Marcy Wallace Excellence in Leadership Award of the, of the William Mitchell College of Law Review. Please help me welcome Judge Chief Guthman. Thank you very much, Mr. Sadamka. Uh, you left out one thing that I went to high school here in St. Paul. And so, I won't say which one, I don't want to get booed. But um, everywhere I go, I always say I'm proud to have gone to high school in St. Paul, and you're going to be just like me, you're going to say the same thing. Thank you for hosting the courts today, uh, and welcome here today members of Humboldt High School and students from uh, the open world learning community, faculty, dignitaries, and court staff who have joined us in the auditorium this morning. And I, uh, I welcome to all the students who've been studying the courts, maybe this case, and it's happening here today. And many are watching these proceedings on cable television this morning. This is a special opportunity for you to view firsthand the operation of the court system here in Minnesota. As you've learned in your studies, social studies or other classes, um, this court is a member of the judicial branch of the state of Minnesota. The Supreme Court is the highest court in that branch, and it is one of three branches of government, the other two being the executive branch and the legislative branch. And those are the three branches of our state government. Many of you have had a chance to study the court system. Many of you have had a chance to talk to attorneys who have visited you in your classrooms. The Minnesota court system is over 150 years old, and it predates the state itself because it started when we were a territory. Uh, the court system is divided into three levels. As Mr. Sadamka indicated, I am a district court judge. The district court is the trial court of the state of Minnesota. We hear all kinds of cases. And when our cases uh, are done with trial, they can be appealed. We are divided into 10 judicial districts. Ramsey County is the second judicial district. So I'm the chief judge of one of those 10 districts, the second district here in Ramsey County. There are 19 judges of the Court of Appeals, and they hear appeals from district court. And then Minnesota's highest court is the Supreme Court, which has seven justices. So how does the case get to the Supreme Court? Well, the Supreme Court hears appeals out of the Court of Appeals, Workers' Compensation Court of Appeals, and the Tax Court. The Supreme Court also automatically hears appeals from all first-degree murder, murder convictions. It goes straight from the district court to the Supreme Court in any election contest cases. Today you're going to hear the case of State of Minnesota Respondent versus Ricky Darnell Waiters, Appellant. And I'll give you a brief overview of the case. Appellant Ricky Waiters was indicted for first degree murder and attempted first degree murder based on allegations that he fired gunshots outside of a bar in Winona that killed one adult male and injured another. Mr. Waiters was charged with first degree murder under a Minnesota statute for committing an intentional homicide during a drive-by shooting. During closing arguments, the prosecutor told the jurors to, quote, look at the evidence, unquote, and, quote, 
not let emotions, unquote, affect their decision. The jury found Mr. Waiters guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. In responding to special interrogatories, and those are questions on the verdict form, the jurors concluded that Waiters intentionally discharged a firearm towards a person or an occupied building, but did not intentionally discharge a firearm towards an occupied vehicle. On appeal to the Supreme Court today and the arguments you're about to hear, the issues include one, whether the state presented sufficient evidence to prove that appellant recklessly fired gunshots at a building, and two, whether the prosecutor engaged in reversible misconduct during the closing arguments in front of the jury. This case originated in Winona County. Now, this is a real case, and real cases are governed by rules of decorum. The lawyers, the judges, and all guests, like yourselves, are expected to obey those rules of decorum. So the same rules that apply in the courtroom apply here to you today. It's important that the justices hearing the case and the lawyers arguing the case not be distracted and be, and so they can concentrate on what they're trying to do here today and on their business. So any activity that distracts from the court process is grounds for removal from the auditorium, just like it would be if the same distracting behavior took place in a courtroom. The oral arguments today will take about an hour. So now it's time to convene court here at the Humboldt High School Auditorium. Thank you. for argument this morning, Waiters versus the State of Minnesota. Ms. Rosenberg, you've reserved five minutes for rebuttal. That's correct, you may proceed when you're ready. May it please the court, for the record, I am Leslie J. Rosenberg, Assistant Appellate Defender representing Mr. Ricky Darnell Waiters. This case is on direct appeal from a judgment of conviction, um, as this court knows from one subdivision of first degree murder and Mr. Waiters was sentenced to a life sentence and a consecutive sentence of 180 months for attempted first degree murder. The predicate felony offense for this subdivision of first degree murder was drive by shooting. The key issue I'd like to discuss at oral argument this morning is that there was not a drive by shooting. The state did not prove a drive by shooting. And although, as lay people might understand drive-by shooting, and they may think that it simply means you shoot at someone from a car, that is not the legal definition under the Minnesota statute. And the statute was a carefully crafted and limited in nature statute, limited by the legislature. Now, I want to, although I'm focusing on this issue, I just want to note that I'm not conceding the merits of the other issue I've raised in my brief, and we understand the standard of review, but my client feels very strongly we are not conceding the self-defense claim, and although my client did intentionally shoot at Mr. Johnson and Mr. O'Brien, he did testify he did not intend to kill them. He did not shoot to kill. He only shot in self-defense to stop them. That being said, I would like to focus on the meaning of the words at or toward in the drive-by shooting statute. I think that is the key to this case. Counsel, I want to ask you about that over here. Um, <laughs> isn't it, uh, the words, it's not just at in, that, in the statute, but it has or towards a building. Doesn't that um, broaden the crime? I mean, you don't have to shoot at a building, you just have to shoot in the general direction of a building. Yes, Your Honor, they, the statute uses both words. Toward means in the direction of, and I would note that it doesn't mean in the general direction of, 
And again, if, if you look at respondent's brief on page 24, he has um, the dictionary definition, and it says, in the direction of, colon, near. So in the direction of needs to be distinguished from in the vicinity of or in the proximity of. So what at would mean, for example, if, if I had a weapon and I'm standing right here and uh, the flag of Minnesota is very close to me and I picked up my gun and I fired at the flag, that's at, it's very direct. Toward means in the direction of so that if the bullet, the bullet's trajectory is toward the flag and if there's no intervening force or interruption, that bullet is going to reach the flag. Now, I think that the case State v. Stevens, which was decided by the Court of Appeals in 1998, gives a very good understanding of what toward means versus at. So in State v. Stevens, you have two cars, and one car is chasing another car, and they're going at speeds of up to 85 miles an hour. Now, the car that's chasing the other car, the defendants in there, they want to shoot the victim in, in the car that they're following. But the victim is inside the car, and, and it's a high-speed chase. These cars are moving. So one defendant leans out of the window, and he shoots. So he's not shooting at the victim because the victim isn't standing right in front of him. He's not standing still. He's shooting toward the victim because he's shooting toward the car. And if, if there had been no movement of the car in front of him, if there had been no intervening force of that car making a right turn, the trajectory of the bullet was toward the victim in the car. Counsel, let's go back to your hypothetical situation of shooting at the flag. Let's say you take the gun and you aim one inch to the right of the flag and then pull the trigger. Have you shot toward the flag? No, Your Honor. You, At, you, and let, I mean, and let's assume maybe you're not a perfect marksman. You, your, your shot may vary an inch or two, so it may or may not hit the flag. Are, aren't you still shooting toward the flag? Not under this statute. And I would contrast this with, for example, and I didn't cite these statutes in my brief, but I believe the court and the experience responded are familiar. We have statutes, for example, that criminalize selling drugs in a school zone, in a park zone, in a public housing zone. And those statutes don't simply say uh, you can't sell uh, near a school, because how would we know what near means? Is it an inch from a school? Is it a mile from the school? Is it 10 miles from the school? So we have definitions of school zone and park zone. For example, school zone, 300 yards within the radius of the school. Counsel, what is the significance of uh, Vang to your argument? The significance of Vang is that the defendant shot at and toward the garage, and the bullets went into the garage. So that was a clear example that the court was not saying, well, there was a shooting in proximity to a building or near a building. And to continue with my other point. But counsel, you just said at and toward. And as I understood earlier, you were trying to differentiate between at and toward. Well, at is more direct. So toward talks about the trajectory of the, bill, of the bullet, the direction of the bullet, and at simply means uh, it's more direct. You're right there, you point at something. So again, the example would be in Stevens, if, if something is a, is a little ways away, so the victim is inside of the car, the cars are moving, and the bullet is going, the trajectory of the bullet is in the direction of the car. Now, for a school zone, for example, it would that, be... Counsel, that seems like you're focusing on the trajectory of the bullet rather than what the person is doing who's actually aiming. I mean, they're shooting at a person in the vehicle. It's not... So why would we focus on the trajectory versus where the person's actually aiming. Toward, if you look at the, at the definition of toward and you look at respondent's brief, the dictionary says in the direction of, and then there's a colon and near. So there's, a, there's a, a nearness issue, an issue of physical distance. So for example- well, Counsel, if, let me stop you there. Here, the facts, and, and tell me if I, I don't have them correct, but the facts are that the victims and other patrons of the bar 
were standing really at the back door of the bar. They were standing in that sort of gap between the bar and this trailer, but closer, it seems to me, to the back door. Many of the witnesses testified that the victims were standing at the back door of the bar uh, where people stood to smoke. So why isn't that toward uh, either that building or, as we know, there was a house behind them? But, but my point is that they were standing close enough to the bar that multiple uh, witnesses testified and described it as standing near the back door. In the vicinity of, in the proximity of, is not towards. So if we interpret, the, if the court were to interpret the statute, and I believe it will be incorrect, that um, firing toward or at a building means firing anywhere near a building, what does that mean? Does it mean you fire 100 feet from the building, two miles from the building, five miles from the building? So going back to the statutes of school zone, we know we have due process, we have notice. We know that if you sell drugs within 300 yards radius, you violate the statute. Here, in terms of drive-by shooting, if we say, well, toward means near. What does near mean? Well, counsel, uh, I, are we, do, are, can we be informed on that topic about what near means by the location of, say, the shell casings from the bullets? Doesn't that, doesn't that tell us something about uh, the vicinity here? Well, it could in a different case, but here the shell casings were in the car, so that doesn't tell us anything. Now, if you well, look- There were bullet fragments found near the, in the driveway of the adjacent house, right? Well, there was one bullet- And one bullet found in the chair, the lawn chair, I think, that was, that was next to the bar. The chair and the driveway were not, the trajectory of the bullets going to the chair and the fence was not toward the building. So I think it's important to understand the scene and what happened. Appellant's car backed down the alley and went south on Ewing and stopped at the midpoint in this gap, this eight feet gap. And he's sitting in the driver's seat, so he's, he's furthest from the curb, but he's going south, so the car is parked right at the curb. Now he's in a geo tracker. He's shooting, he's sitting down, and he's shooting across the passenger seat and out the window. He was not leaning out the window. So his, his ability to fire was limited by the, the area of this window. Now, the bar, EB's bar, is to the southwest of his car. The trajectory of the bullets, and this was testified to by the state's expert witness, the trajectory of the bullets were east to west. And what that means is that he picked up his hand, he fired straight at Mr. Johnson, who was about 15 feet in front of the window. He fired straight and that bullet went straight. And straight means it went east to west. Now one bullet, and, and, and there was no match made, but the expert testified that the bullet found in the driveway was not inconsistent with a 40 caliber weapon. But what's key is that there was no house behind the fence. There was no house there. That was a backyard. And the fence was a six foot high privacy fence. So sitting in his car in the driver's seat, picking up that gun and firing out his window, it defies the laws of physics to think that that bullet could go out of the window and suddenly rise up in the air, six feet, seven feet up in the air, and go over the fence and then veer left to hit the house. It couldn't happen, it didn't happen. And I think it's very important to look at two things. If you look at page 25 of Respondent's Brief, he says, defendant fired to the west in the direction of the building. West means straight ahead. The bar was not to the west of the car. And there's no transcript site there. There can't be a transcript site because that's an incorrect statement. And if you read the closing argument of the trial prosecutor, and I think this is very important, she never states that appellant fired in the direction of the building because he did not do so. She says, he deliberately and meticulously moved the barrel of his gun and aimed for his targets, Mr. Johnson and Counsel, Mr. O'Brien. Counsel, let me ask you the, this question. I'm, I'm concerned that, and this is a question I will engage uh, opposing counsel with, um, exactly what the legal standard is that you would have us apply here. Um, what are, how are we to instruct the jury? What are, what are we to use for the standard as to whether or not a drive-by shooting 
has occurred in the statutory sense. Um, I think there's a possibility here that if the if the if there isn't precision to the language, firing um, a weapon in an, in a municipal area with buildings around would always qualify for uh, a drive-by shooting. How do we deal with that problem? Exactly, Your Honor. And the way you deal with it, I think, is to uh, abide by the plain, clear, and unambiguous language of the statute. So I think the, jur the jury was properly instructed. The jury was told a drive-by shooting is you, you fire from a car at or toward a building. And toward means in the direction of. So you look at the trajectory of the bullet. In Vang, they said, well, obviously, the trajectory of the bullet was at the garage, toward the garage, because it landed in the garage. So here, what we have is we have no bullets, no bullet holes in any building. We have no building behind or in front of any of the people so who counsel, were shot. So, <clears throat> if there, let's say there's a, a shot fired, it ricochets and goes a different direction and kills somebody, then, then where would you stand on that? If the bullet's trajectory was at or toward a building and the only reason, and it reached the building and then ricocheted off, then it was fired toward the building. If it ricocheted off of something before it reached the building, and it would have reached the building, but for something interfering, then we can say toward. Here is where we cannot say toward. Where a building is to the left of, of for example, myself, and I'll use the flag as an example. So the flag is to the left of me. I pick up my gun, and I aim it at that flag. That is not toward the American flag. That is toward the Minnesota flag. And this is what happened here. Mr. Johnson was standing in front of the car's window. The appellant aimed at him, aimed at Mr. O'Brien, who was a little to his right, about 10 feet behind him. And E.B.'s bar is over here to the left. And that's why. Counsel, what about the testimony in the record that said, from one of the witnesses that said he was aiming uh, across, uh, you know, a spectrum, and we we know from um, the shell casings in the car that there were six shots, so there weren't just the two that hit each of the of the victims. Um, we have to take the evidence in in most favorably to the jury's verdict. So doesn't that support that there was a whole uh, range of trajectory there? No, Your Honor, it does not. And that was not the testimony. The testimony was that he raised his hand and he moved it left to right. But what he was limited by was the area of the window in the geo tracker because he wasn't leaning out of the window. Had he tried to aim toward EB's bar, he would be shooting through the interior of his car or through the windshield. And that didn't happen. And that's why the trajectory of the bullets east to west in a straight line, hit Mr. Johnson, hit Mr. O'Brien, hit the chair, hit the fence. That's all in a straight line. And there wasn't any testimony otherwise. The officers testified that um, the, the bullet that was recovered was in the driveway, and it actually was a paved area uh, between the house and the detached garage. And if you look at the exhibits, and I would specifically ask you to look at Exhibit 170, Exhibit 148, Exhibit 149, you'll see there was no house, but the bullet couldn't have gone over the fence in any case. The bullet can't come straight out of the car window and suddenly turn left. It defies the laws of physics. What do we do about the uh, bullet that went through the arm of the plastic chair, which was in the vicinity of the building? Does that matter? It doesn't matter in terms of, of, of it only matters in the sense that it again shows the trajectory of the bullet was not toward the building. It was, as the expert testified, east to west in a straight line yeah. back towards the fence. Does it matter what, the, what his target was? You know, there's a lot of language in our case law that talking about drive-by shooting is the target is the building or the vehicle. And so does that, does that piece of it, interpreting at and toward in terms of was he actually shoot, was his idea to shoot at a building or a car as opposed to shooting at a person? I, I think that Vang is instructive here. And Vang, 
um, discussed the difference between... No, Vang was dealing with recklessly, though. That wasn't interpreting at or toward, right? And we've never interpreted the words at or toward as a matter of holding as opposed to dicta. Wouldn't that be accurate? You can explain Vang, but... I, I think that there's an implicit uh, interpretation, Vang. I think that in Vang, in, in talking about reckless, it defines reckless as talking about the manner of discharge, how he fired. So if he fired toward the building, it doesn't matter whether he intended to hit someone in the building, whether he intended to fire at the building, it just means that that gun was pointed or that a bullet was fired and its trajectory was toward the building. Okay, so you're not making an argument today that because he was aiming at a person as opposed to kind of the actus reus being here targeting a building or a car. That's not part of your argument. No, and, and I would point to, um, and I cited to in my brief, if you look at the trial prosecutor's PowerPoint, and that's uh, Exhibit Q, I think it's very interesting. He, uh, there were two of them, but they, they cited the proper language of the drive-by uh, statute um, recklessly um, firing towards a, from a car towards a, a vehicle or a building, but then there's, there's a little sentence beneath it which says, shot at a person near a building. So really what is going on here today, respondent is asking you to write a new statute. And this statute would be if a person, if you fire from a car and, you, and, and there's a building anywhere nearby, and it could be two feet, a hundred feet, a hundred miles, there's no limitations, we can simply say, well, you shot toward a building because there was a building near. But we don't know what near means because unlike a school zone or a park zone, there's no limiting distance. Council, be before you go further, I want to just make sure I understand your argument. And this is really, in res I'm getting at your response to Justice Thiessen. I got the impression from your brief that one of your arguments was that because Mr. Waiters uh, was firing at the victims, firing at Johnson and O'Brien, that he could not also have been firing at or toward the building, that those are two separate things. I mean, that's how you start out your brief, is that the state has to prove these two separate, two separate uh, crimes. But are you abandoning that? Because in your answer to Justice Thiessen, it, it sort of seemed like you are. You're not making that distinction any, any, any longer. Am I hearing you correctly or not? I think what, what I was trying to say in my brief is that in this case, the shots fired were deliberately fired at the two victims. And the victims were not standing in front of or behind or in a building. So therefore, even under the state's theory, and, and if you look at the state's evidence in a light most favorable to the state, under the, under the standard review, appellant couldn't have been firing toward the building because he only fired at Mr. Johnson and Mr. Well, O'Brien. counsel, isn't that directly contradicted by Vang? Because Vang, in Vang we said those two things can, ha they're not mutually exclusive. Those two things can happen simultaneously. You can be firing at someone and also recklessly discharging that firearm towards a building. Those are, those, those are not mutually ex exclusive uh, items. In some cases, they are not mutually exclusive. An example would be if Mr. Johnson were standing in front of E.B.'s bar so that when he was shot, he was shot and, and, and a bullet went into the building as well, as in Vang, then we would have two separate acts, two separate mental states, but they're happening at the same time. That's what happened in Vang, but that but counsel, didn't that, happen that here. That brings me back to what do we do about the testimony that puts Mr. Johnson and the other victims at the back door of the bar? Well, the testimony was not that Mr. Johnson was at the back door of the bar when he was shot. And I would ask this court to look again, or look for the first time, at Exhibit 24, which is Officer Rystead's squad video. And the, you can see out the windshield of the squad, it drives north on Ewing, and you can see where Mr. Robert Johnson is laying. And he's laying midpoint in the gap. He is not by the back door, and that's what the, the witnesses testified to. Yes, he, they came out the back door to smoke, 
But then they were in this gap area at the picnic tables, by the chairs. Mr. Johnson was approaching the geo tracker when he was shot. So I think that the facts are very important in this case. And we do have the best evidence being the squad video as to where Mr. Johnson was. Well, counsel, if we, if we take the facts most favorable to the verdict, which we're required to do, it seems to me there, there's some conflict about whether Mr. Johnson was approaching the vehicle when he was shot. Um, I think you're right. There is some testimony from one of the, the, the victims, Mr. O'Brien, in fact, I think says that. But all the other witnesses said that, that he was not. And so the jury, I mean, I, I think we have to take. Your Honor, I, I beg to disagree. I think that the witnesses' testimony were that he was approaching the car. And the best evidence is, of course, the squad video, which shows where Mr. Johnson was when he was shot. If he was shot, and his feet were five feet from the curb. If he was shot, he fell, and all the witnesses said that. He was shot and he fell. He can't have fallen there and been at the back door. It's not possible. So again, the squad video is the best evidence. It proves where Mr. Johnson was, and it's my understanding from the record that there was no disagreement. He was starting to approach the car. And that's why the expert testified the trajectory of the bullets was east to west in a straight line. Otherwise, Mr. Johnson couldn't have been shot because again- Counsel, what rule of law are you asking us to adopt? I'm asking you to simply continue interpreting the drive-by shooting statute using the plain meaning of the words at or toward and to state again affirmatively that those terms are not ambiguous, they're clear, and to follow how they were used and interpreted in State v. Stevens and in State v. Bank. Counsel, so can you I'm give still... an example of recklessly firing toward a building that would not be recklessly firing at a building? Well, I think that's just a, a, um, a difference in terms of nearness. So if, if I'm at the back of the auditorium here and I point my gun to try and hit the Minnesota flag, I would say I'm firing toward the flag. Standing right here, I would probably more likely say I fired at the flag. So again, if you look at page 24, respondent's brief, and he cites the dictionary definition of toward, it says, quote, in the direction of colon near. So for example, let's say I pointed my gun towards the American flag, the Minnesota flag here and said, I am firing towards Spain. Okay, it's 5,000 miles away, but I'm firing towards Spain. That's somewhat absurd. So there is a, a, a nearness of a physical, a spatial component to toward, and at is closer, toward is a little bit further, and then, and then we stop. So again, the key thing is toward is in the direction of. We look at the trajectory. And here we had undisputed, uncontroverted expert testimony, the state's expert, the trajectory was east to west. And, and, and we yet, are, counsel, you say standing at that podium, if you aimed one inch to the right of the Minnesota flag, you're not firing in the direction of the Minnesota flag? If the trajectory of the bullet is such that it wouldn't hit it, it doesn't meet the at or toward requirement. Now, the legislature could Whether it hits it depends on how good a shot you are. The legislature could easily redraft this, this statute. They could say, if you shoot, recklessly fire at or toward an object within 10 feet on either side. If you don't interpret this as at or toward as I am, I am suggesting, which is how it was used in Stevens, you have a problem with the Constitution of this statute being overbroad. So let's say I, I say to my friend, I'm going to shoot toward that flag, and I point my gun here and, and my hand, you know, or here, and the bullet whizzes by 10 feet from the flag. Should I be? charge, what if it's 100 feet? You're saying an inch, 
but if the legislature wanted to have a range where you could miss, but st it's still toward, they could redraft the statute just the way they drafted the school zone, the park zone, and the public housing <laughs> zone statutes. Those statutes don't say- Council, what, what word does reckless play then in your definition? Reckless simply means we don't have to prove, the state doesn't have to prove intent. So the example they gave in Va Vang is let's say I intentionally want to kill someone. And I, want, and I do it in a reckless manner. I take a bomb, put it in a car, and, and I park it, say, in the school parking lot <clears throat> when the bell rings. So that's a reckless method of killing someone, but we would look at, did I have the intent to kill someone? And then you look at the overall circumstance. Did I have a grudge against this person? Do I know the person? Was I targeting a certain person? Did I know this person was coming out of the school door? Um, Council, so but, but our cases put a limiting gloss on this because you have to do this, you do have to do the tort in a manner where it shows a, a disregard of a substantial and unjustifiable risk of injury to other people or property. So that, I mean, that kind of sets outer limits on your tort, correct? No, Your Honor, that's not correct. Well, the conscious if, if, disregard of a substantial risk means that you are firing toward a building and you don't care that it's a building that someone could be living there. So, for example, um, you know, appellant fired but, but out... to take, excuse me for interrupting, but to take your example, if I'm firing toward Spain, I mean, there's no substantial risk that people in Spain are going to be affected by that bullet. I mean, to me, that's a limiting factor on how broad um, toward can be interpreted in our cases. Yes, it's a limiting factor on toward, but it's not a limiting factor on reckless. So, for example, there was no house behind the fence. An appellant who was trained in the use of firearms and he's sitting in his car, he would know that when he fired out his window that there was no possibility that that bullet was going to rise up in the air and go over the top of the fence, which it did not. So even though you could say uh, he was firing recklessly out of his window, he wasn't consciously disregarding a substantial risk that he would hit the 83 or 84 year old woman living in the house behind the fence. But bullets go through fences and houses all the time. But there was no house behind the fence. And the bullet, I'm saying in terms of the bullet going over the fence, he would know that. So that's not, consciously disregarding a risk is, for example, in Vang, you're shooting at someone and they're standing in front of a garage and, and, and you're shooting six times and you're not really paying attention to where you're shooting. So you hit the person, you hit the garage. So that's a reckless dis discharge Council, at a is, building. How is that materially different from the facts here where he's driving and he's now in front of the bar and he's shooting at victims and other individuals who are standing, even if we take your version, they're standing in the gap. The, the gap is relatively small, small enough that one of the bullets hits one of the chairs that's standing in the gap. So you have an individual firing at, in a densely populated residential area, firing at a bar, firing at where homes are present, firing where individuals are, are clearly standing on the street. How is that not reckless disregard? Reckless disregard, I agree, it means that you're firing your gun uh, in disregard of a risk. But the drive-by shooting says you have to recklessly fire a gun. You're in a car or you just exited a car and you fire towards a building. So that's limited. And what we don't have here is toward a building. And also, if you look again at the closing argument of the state, for example, on, on transcript page 2909, uh, the, the prosecutor stated, he intended to shoot Sean O'Brien with those two shots. He aimed to kill. And during his shooting, he hit the fence that then the bullet went into the driveway. So there was no shooting toward a building. Counsel, your red light's on. Okay, you have thank five, you. You have five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hersey. May it please the court, counsel. My name is Scott Hersey. I'm a special assistant Winona County attorney and I represent the respondent, the state of Minnesota in this appeal. I would first point out that 
the appellant shot towards three buildings. I would submit that the trailer, according to the testimony of Sorum uh, and O'Brien, was a building, a structure uh, that was suitable uh, for providing shelter to human beings. As you can see, the back of that has been modified. There's an entry door, stairs, there's a railing, and in fact, both Sorum and O'Brien testified that that was used for storage. Council, it, what's the distance involved? So how far, uh, the people who were shot, how far <coughs> were they from the bar? How far were they from the house? How far were they from the trailer? What does the record tell us? The, the testimony differed somewhat, but I would submit that uh, it's very similar. Sorum testified that when the shots were fired, he was standing by the back door by Robert Johnson and he heard six shots. O'Brien testified that he was by the back door by Robert Johnson um, when the shots were fired. Um, in addition, he thought he heard five or six shots. Mr. Legiza saw three flashes of the gun and then two more. He testified at the time Robert Johnson Mr. Sorum and Mr. Jacobson were three feet from the back door. And in viewing the photographs, uh, including Exhibit 3 and the group exhibit in uh, Exhibit 214, I would ask the court to take a look at the chair that was right by the back door. There are several chairs, and one has to be sure they're looking at the right one, but it's the one that the BCA forensic scientist described as the one having bullet impacts C and D. It went through the arm of the chair. And if you look at those exhibits. So you're saying the testimony is <coughs> then that the victims were about three feet from the bar when they were shot? That is what the testimony indicates. Now, O'Brien did indicate that when the appellant stopped in the street and was saying something to the individuals by the back door, um, Mr. Johnson had just started to head in that direction. Um, when he was shot, and then he fell immediately when he was shot. But So um, Mr. Johnson is moving away from the bar? He is moving alongside. He would be moving to the east along the back, just starting to. But still, O'Brien said he was Par by the Parallel back bar. to the bar? Is that the way he's moving? Pardon me? Is he moving parallel to the bar? Parallel to the bar. Okay. Uh, and that was the only person that indicated that uh, was Mr. O'Brien. Mr. Legiza and Mr. Sorum both said that he was right by the back door. And I would submit that the photographs show that the chair where, that was hit by the bullet appears to be about three feet from the back door, so it is very close to the building. Counsel, the thing that, that, that concerns me about this case that I worry about is that under the state's theory, the drive-by shooting becomes sort of an all-purpose charge. If you have have a discharge of a firearm in any kind of a municipal setting with buildings um, around, um, the argument's going to be made that, well, it was at or it was, you know, at or in the direction of a building. And I'm just wondering what the limiting principle is here. For example, if, if there's a firearm discharged inside a building, I mean, obviously, uh, that, you know, there's an argument that it was fired at the building as well. What, what do we do about that? I would suggest to the court that the limiting factors are at or toward, and toward is in the direction of or near, and recklessness. If the defendant in that type of situation consciously takes the risk, the substantial and unjustifiable risk that firing that firearm may hit a building, under the definition in this court's cases, that is sufficient if it's reckless. So, but it still has to be at or toward. But, but in some parts of, uh, of a municipal area, urban area, city area, um, any discharge of a firearm is at risk of hitting a building. So what do we do about that? Maybe we don't do anything, but, what, but, but you see what I'm concerned about. It becomes, well, anyway. I, I, I see the court's concern, and that was expressed in State versus Stevens. They pointed out the fact that this was chasing a car, shooting at it during rush hour, um, and it very possibly could hit any car because there were cars all over parked and moving. That was expressed in Stevens. But in this particular case, I think we are bound by the facts, and the facts in this case show the very close proximity of all these individuals to the building. But it's not just the bar. We have three buildings. That storage trailer was a building. The bar obviously was a building, and I respectfully disagree with counsel's description of where the bullets went related to- What testimony to is there in the record that says these victims were by the house or by the trailer? 
That was the testimony of Sorum, O'Brien, and Legizai. And would ask the court to look very carefully at that testimony where so they placed it. So how far away them. were the victims from the house in terms of distance? How many feet, yards, how far away were they? I can't tell from the record how far they were from the house. It, it possibly would be on the diagram with measurements done by Mr. Bacon, the defense investigator. But what I can tell you, if one looks uh, at Exhibit 3 um, and similar exhibits in Exhibit 2214, one will see that that bullet hole in the chair lines up directly with bullet hole E in the fence, and that is directly in line with the house. That house was directly in that line of fire of the appellant in this particular case. And so that was directly at, and certainly was in the direction of that house. And just because a bullet goes through something before it goes in the direction of a building or a vehicle, um, that doesn't make any difference. If what it's recklessly- What do you make of our case law that says, that describes this element of at or toward as the element of target? Are you make, is your contention that the defendant's target here was a house or a building? Or a car? Well, clearly not a car, but that it was a building? Well, first of all, I would suggest that trajectory doesn't matter. What does matter is at or near um, and the reckless discharge. And in this but particular what do you make case, of our case law that says, that defines that element as targeting a building? I, I don't see the case law. Hayes, well, Tao, they, all, they both describe that element as the element of, of the target of the, of, the, of the discharge. I would well, say. I, maybe the better question is, is your contention that, miss, that the defendant here targeted a building? He shot in the direction of, he shot toward a building, and as far as the neighboring residents go, uh, that bullet went directly in towards that vehicle. And but I would say that Vang that. suggests that- Did he target that, that house? No, but- Okay, that's what I under want to your contention is not that he targeted the house. No. Or that he targeted the bar. No, okay. but under Vang, I would respectfully submit your decision there indicates that it doesn't matter. Wait, was that really the holding of Vang? I mean, that Vang, was Vang actually didn't look at actually ask that specific question, right? Vang did have a footnote that indicated that it doesn't matter if he shoots at the individuals and misses and takes the risk of hitting a building. And that is why I would suggest that Vang directly applies here. And I don't know why the court would footnote and stress that particular point uh, unless it well, we do makes that a difference. Lot. Well, that may be. <laughs> But I do read the footnotes too. But um, counsel, when I look at the language, um, because at or toward follows recklessly discharging, to me that shows that the at or toward doesn't need to be targeting. It just means that you, you've, in carelessness, have, have done that thing, but you didn't need to have that intent. That's the whole purpose of the recklessness in, in the drive-by shooting statute. I, I agree. The, the point is that um, the shooter simply has to recklessly or consciously disregard the risk that he may hit a building or another vehicle. Well, but that can't be what it is, that you may hit a building. I mean, that's what the at or toward is about, right? It can't just be that you might hit a building, right? Well, that's true. You, you take those in juxtaposition, at or toward and reckless. You take those together in Which juxtaposition. Which means that you have to have, like, recklessly that you're, that the, you're, you're targeting toward a building. Well, correct, correct. But not targeting at, targeting in the sense of toward or in the direction of or even near. You take that risk. You know it's a risk, but you take that risk. And here this individual shot through a narrow gap. Remember, the diagram indicated that that was eight feet, 10 inches wide. And he's even over closer to the building than the middle of that, which would be four feet, five inches. That is very near. And again, so what you just said, though, is that he wasn't shooting at the building. He was shooting at the gap. He was shooting in the direction of individuals, and he was shooting in the direction of three different buildings. And he came very close. Well, he can't have been shooting in the direction of three different buildings. I mean, one building's over here, one building's over here, one building's back there. He can't be shooting at all three buildings. He's shooting toward them, and the issue is how close. And that was a factual issue, and I would submit that this is a sufficiency of the evidence review, and I would submit that that is a jury question, and I would submit <coughs> that unless the jury acted unreasonably in making that determination, then this court should uphold uh, the jury's determination and finding of guilt. 
So, Council. Council, your position, as I understand it, is that the definition of tort is in the direction of, right? Correct. Okay. So let's imagine that I'm in my uh, backyard with my BB gun, and there's an airplane flying about 20,000 feet above me. And I take that BB gun, and I aim it at the airplane, and I shoot the BB gun. Have I uh, fired a shot toward the airplane? You have, but it has to be a substantial and unjustifiable risk of hitting. I'm just saying as a definitional matter, have I shot at the airplane? You have shot toward, toward, toward the airplane? Yes, you have. Okay, now I um, take my BB gun and I aim about a foot ahead of the airplane. Have I shot toward the airplane? You have also shot toward and in the direction of the airplane. But the question in that becomes the other part of the definition is whether that poses a substantial and unjustified risk. Yeah, I know that's risk. where you want to go, but I'm, I'm focused strictly on the definition of the word toward. But I, I agree with you with, with those points. Take uh, Ms. Rosenberg's hypothetical of shooting toward the, or shooting near the flag. Let's say it goes, the, she's aiming one foot to the right of the flag, and it goes one foot to the right of the flag. Has she shot toward the flag? She has, because there is a risk that that could still hit the flag, no matter where she aimed. How about six feet to the right of the flag? Potentially. Then How that, about ten feet? Perhaps not. And, and that is where the so facts... So what's the, what's the rule of law by which you determine whether six feet is, in, is toward and ten feet's not? The rule of law doesn't have to apply to that. The rule of law is at or towards, and it is the application of those terms to the facts before the jury that the jury determines because this is a fact question. We know what the, what the terms are and then the jury will apply the facts to those terms as instructed so by the court. So you shoot in the direction if there's a risk that the bullet might hit a building or a what, whatever the statute provides. A substantial and so unjustifiable risk of causing injury to a building or other individuals as has been described in the case law. And I would submit that if we do take a look at the exhibits in this particular case, it does show that the trajectory of at least the bullet that went through the arm of the chair impacts C and D contained in the BCA diagram and E, which is in the fence, and the uh, edging around the fence. Uh, those photographs show that that building there is directly uh, in line um, with that particular residence. And I would ask the court to take a look at Exhibit 3, Exhibit 189, Exhibit 191, and Exhibit 170, which is the diagram. Counsel, if we rule in your favor in this case, doesn't that effectively mean that any shooting in the city is going to be a drive-by shooting? I would say not, Justice, um, because we have the facts that are limiting the holding in this case. A holding applies to the particular case, and in this particular case, we do have the situation where those bullets were fired in the direction of what I would describe as three buildings and individuals were standing close to the building. Three feet away from the back door is very close, and this individual fired a volley of six shots recklessly in that direction. Two bullets hit Mr. Johnson, at least two bullets hit Mr. O'Brien, and two bullets didn't. So, counsel, if I'm understanding you, <clears throat> we do not need uh, a limiting as far as a measurement because it's limited by the, the, the law that as we currently have it applied to the specific facts of the scenario. That is exactly what I am saying. And I think that this court has adequately interpreted the drive-by shooting statute in both Hayes, indicating that the first clause of that statute is the operative clause, and in Bang, indicating that a person uh, can miss the intended target and still be shooting in the direction of a building. And I would submit that is exactly what happened in this particular case. And I would simply point out that Bang had indicated, and I just want to quote one sentence, a person can simultaneously intend to kill someone and recklessly discharge a firearm in a manner demonstrating a conscious disregard of a substantial and unjustified risk of injury to other people and other property. And I would submit that that is exactly the situation that we have here. We have the intent to kill both Mr. Johnson and Mr. O'Brien, and at the same time, we have the reckless discharge where the 
um, appellant took the risk of hitting any of the three buildings that were near and in the direction of where he was shooting. And we do have the neighboring residence that was directly in his field of fire. Council, you uh, indicate that um, one building that he shot at was the semi-trailer. Um, can a building have wheels on it? It certainly can. And in Hoffman, uh, that was a motor home. And that was designated as a building, uh, even though it was a, a mobile home and could be moved. In this particular case, as both the testimony, well, let me say that the photographs indicated, um, as well as some supporting testimony, this was used for storage. And if it's sufficient to be used for storage for items associated with a bar and with a, uh, an entry door built into it with stairs, uh, it would be sufficient for providing shelter for the people putting uh, stored items in there and taking them out of there. And plus, uh, the photographs will show that this was, uh, the front end of this was up on blocks, so it was used as a permanent structure. Council, was this theory uh, presented to the jury about the semi trailer being uh, a building. I, I didn't see anything in closing arguments about it, and I, 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 I don't think it was uh, a theory at trial. I think Can, you are correct, Justice. I don't recall that, but I will note that both um, Sorum and O'Brien stated that the building was used for storage, and multiple photographs do show uh, the rebuilt door, the stairs, and no, the No, I understand that it is a building, but I don't think that was argued um, below. And um, do we have the authority to uphold uh, this verdict on a, on a different theory on appeal? It would seem to me that there are facts in the record, as you indicated, that do justify the determination that that was a building. Um, it is up to the jury to determine the facts in this particular case. Um, and I certainly believe that the facts that were available to them supported their verdict and they could well have determined that was a building. But in any event, I would submit that the other two buildings certainly support the jury's verdict. Uh, the neighboring residence was directly in line of one uh, bullet um, and there were shots fired within about three feet of the back door because we know that's where Mr. Johnson was um, and we also know that's where uh, Mr. O'Brien was when they were hit and they were Mr. each Hersey, hit by two bullets. Mr. Hersey, if you could, would you touch briefly on the prosecutorial misconduct argument and, um, and, and address the, this concern? The prosecutor does say, and, and granted it's in, it's in rebuttal, but the prosecutor does uh, say in closing that um, uh, she wants to make sure that, that uh, the jury is not focused on uh, emotions and that uh, defense counsel was trying to play on, on, uh, on their emotions. And so the issue is whether or not those, com those comments were belittling of the, uh, of the appellant's defense, which of course is impermissible. And I guess my concern about those comments is that his defense was that it was self-defense and that he was frightened. He, in his testimony, these people were charging the car. And one of them, according to, again, Mr. Waiters, had a weapon. And he was fearful. And so, uh, to some extent, defense counsel had to argue uh, in, in trial and in closing, um, had to show that fear, because that fear, of course, <coughs> has to be a reasonable fear in order for him to prevail on his self-defense claim. So for the prosecutor to then come back on rebuttal and say, well, he's just trying to play with your emotions, uh, doesn't that in some way, or at least potentially, belittle or disparage um, his self-defense claim? Justice, I would say no, uh, respectfully, but I, I would say in the context in which it was stated, it changes the flavor of that. She just didn't say, oh, that was emotional in that closing argument, don't pay any attention to it. She didn't tell him not to pay attention to it. Uh, the prosecutor simply said, you will be instructed to make your determination uh, on the evidence in this case. And that's exactly one of the instructions that the district court gave, which is a standard jig instruction. In addition, most of this court's jurisprudence in Mayhorn, uh, Salitros, Porter, uh, they talk about the prosecutor appealing to the passions, the emotions, and the prejudice of the jurors. And in this case, the prosecutor actually did the opposite, just asked the jury, you know, make a dispassionate 
decision and determination based upon the evidence that has been presented to you. And I would submit that that is essentially what prosecution standard 3-6.8C of the ABA standards say. And I would submit that that's what the prosecution was attempting to do um, with the language that was given here. And even if that happened to be error, and that is up to this court to determine, um, I would submit that it's harmless beyond any reasonable doubt because this was a very strong case with three eyewitnesses to the shooting, much physical evidence of the defendant's own testimony that he shot both victims, although he claimed in self-defense. Well, it's a, it's a very strong case relative to the murder, but the drive-by shooting piece uh, is a question of first impression here relative to the terminology. Am I right about that? That is an issue that this court will have to determine. Yes. So you're saying, counsel, that we've never upheld a, a conviction for drive-by shooting at or toward a building when there's no evidence that any bullet hit a building? That is the difference between Vang and this case. But this court did footnote. So we've never had a case like this before Not where, where the bullet never hit a building? That's correct. Most cases are different than the other cases. Rarely do you see a case, I would imagine, that is exactly on all fours. And the difference between this and Vang is that, in the state's view, he shot toward buildings, um, and sometimes he hit his target and sometimes he didn't, but he recklessly endangered the buildings in this particular case. And no, he didn't hit a building with a bullet in this case, but he came very close and he consciously took that chance. So what, what I think my conceptual problem with this case is kind of in a felony murder context. You know, so you're convicted of first degree murder, you go away for jail for life without premeditation, right? That's what felony murder allows you to do. And in the, the other kind of predicate felonies are clearly distinct kind of crimes, right? You have a, a you're committing a burglary or an aggravated robbery. So there's, there's a thing you're doing first and then someone gets killed. And here it seems, in this case, it's flipped on its head. The thing was, he was trying to kill somebody and then it just happened that a building was nearby. And that's what I'm really struggling with in this case, if that makes sense. But if you could help me out with that. Justice, I, I believe this court dealt with that issue uh, in State v. Harris, if, if I'm understanding the, the query correctly, and in State v. Harris, this court had indicated that it doesn't matter if the um, predicate crime occurred first, if it occurred later, as long as it occurred during that course of conduct, that is sufficient to satisfy a felony murder charge. So I believe this court has dealt with that problem previously in Harris, and as long as both of those uh, occurrences happened, the killing and then the predicate crime, um, the statute is satisfied. But I guess it, that I th I, I, that's, a, that's a, a good argument, but it also seems like the, 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 sh the shooting here, the shooting of the bullets here, was the, you know, in burglary, you're going in and doing something different, right? It's not about shooting the gun. In aggravated robbery, it's about doing something different. Here, it's the shooting of the gun. And I guess it partly goes back to what Justice Anderson's question is. I mean, this is gonna be a tool that prosecutors can use any time there's a shooting in an urban area with buildings to take a second degree murder, an intentional shooting of someone, and turn it into a first degree murder. I mean, and maybe that's the legislature's decision, but that just seems, it seems like we're giving the prosecution a pretty powerful tool to turn, you know, a, a limited term of prison into a life without getting, without any possibility of release. Justice, I, I would suggest that the, the, if this is a powerful tool, it was a powerful tool that the legislature intended to give to prosecutors. But prosecutors are always limited by the jurisprudence of this court. And I would submit that this court gives guidance on the interpretation of various legislative and enactments. And counsel, wouldn't you agree that this has been in place for quite some time, as have urban areas, and that we have not seen the fallout as the court is worried about? That is true. Uh, this statute, uh, and unfortunately, drive-by shootings happen all too frequently, and the case law reflects that. Um, but 
Um, we have not seen um, the misuse, I would say, of this particular statute based on the case law coming out of this court and the Court of Appeals that have by and large uh, upheld those convictions. And again, um, we are subject to this court's interpretation of the various statutory terms and certainly between the legislature's uh, enactment of the statute and this court's interpretation and application of it to various factual scenarios is how practitioners, uh, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and the lower courts uh, all uh, react and interact with to make sure that we're doing the best we can to follow this court's guidance. And I would submit that it varies by the factual circumstances in each particular case. And this is a particular case that varies somewhat on its facts from Vang, but I would suggest that Vang strongly informs the court's determination in this particular case. It is correct that we do have a factual difference, but uh, this court can give all the practitioners and lower courts guidance by its determination as to whether the jury acted reasonably in applying the law given to it to the facts of this particular case. And I see my time is about to expire. I would respectfully ask the court to deny the defendant's request for relief by dismissing counts one and two and reversing the remaining counts for retrial. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Uh, Ms. Rosenberg, you have five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. This case is a misuse of the statute. It is very unfair for this court to be asked to turn the word toward into vicinity of or proximity of such that no one has any notice of when they fire a gun, whether it's going to be considered near enough to a building to be charged But isn't that what juries are with, for? Pardon? Isn't that what juries are for, is to take the word toward and interpret it in a reasonable way? So it doesn't, doesn't the fact that we have a jury put limitations on what that vicinity could be? No. The jury doesn't decide the law. The jury is instructed to you to We're not, add or well, toward. Well, they're instructed it has to be add or toward, right? And then I, the jury has some discretion as kind of peers to decide what toward means in this particular context. In this case, they only have the discretion to decide that toward means what it does mean, which is a plain English meaning, in the direction of. They cannot decide that the word toward can mean in the vicinity or in the proximity of. They can't decide that toward means if I fire, again an example, if I fire at the flag, that toward means that, that uh, the marshal, we can consider that the marshal, I fire toward the marshal. They can't decide that if I fire at toward the flag of Minnesota, that toward means in the vicinity of that I could have hit any of these people, and, and we would charge that. So if the legislature wanted that, they could have easily drafted a statute that said firing at toward or within 10 feet proximity of a building, just as they define school zone, uh, park zone, or housing zone. By limiting the statute to at or toward in the direction of, we look at the trajectory of the bullet. And that's what the state did at trial. They had their expert testify the trajectory was east to west. And we know that appellant's trajectory was limited by the fact that he's in the car and there is that small window. And I would also like to, to state that, again, the house was not behind the fence and ask the court to look at these, at these pictures, which are very clear. Um, toward does not mean proximity or vicinity or near. For this court, on a case-by-case -case basis, to look at facts and decide, well, in this case, mm, the bullet was three feet from the building, that's okay. In that case, it was five feet from the building, no good. In this case, two feet. And we're going to have inconsistent results. We have a lack of due process. We have an unconstitutional so is it your, statute. Counsel, is it your position then, in a case uh, under this statute, there needs to be evidence that the bullet struck a building. No, not necessarily, because we're looking at the trajectory. So if, if the bullet is fired toward a building, but it lands right in front of the building, that could possibly meet the statute. Um, if there's a chair in front of the building, and that bullet uh, goes into the chair and stops such that the trajectory was to the building, but the chair interrupted that, that could also be toward. What toward is not is that 
I fire, as appellant did, I fired Mr. Johnson, who is in front of the window of the car. And then we say, well, EB's bar, which is four or five feet to the left, that's included in tort. That's what happened here. And so there's no, so your position would be in this case, there's no evidence that the bullets were in line with a building. Exactly. Counsel, and you've been doing a lot of shooting during your argument today. <laughs> Let's say you, you have a gun, fire a shot, and it, the bullet flies by my ear, about one inch away from my ear. Is it reasonable for me to say that you fired toward me? No, no. No, that would be unreasonable for me to say that when the it bullet passed by my ear and It's the facts and circumstances. If you ducked your head or you flinched, then it might be toward. But again, we need a bright line here in order for this statute to be constitutional. If the legislature decided not to give a range, not to use the words proximity or in the vicinity of, if it only used the words at or toward, which it did, and we look at Stevens and we look at Vang, we see that we have to look at the trajectory. And one uh, evidence of a trajectory is that the bullets actually strike the building. That's what happened in Vang. The court said that corroborated it. In Stevens, what corroborated is the victim saying, well, I saw the defendant lean out the window and he fired the gun and he's behind us, he's chasing us, he wants to shoot the victim. That was toward. We have no cases where this court or the Court of Appeals had said at or toward means nearby in the vicinity of because, again, we don't know what that means. And, and, and that's why this court has had these questions and have tried to ask respondent, well, what about if it's three feet away, one inch away, five feet away? This court is not the legislature. It shouldn't rewrite these statutes. It shouldn't make these decisions. The statute was carefully drafted and carefully limited. And it's unfair for the prosecution to have shoehorned this defendant into a first degree murder conviction when the evidence is not there. So I see my time is up and I would ask you to vacate uh, the first degree murder conviction and um, dismiss that charge. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thanks to both counsel for the help that you provided to the court in this case. This matter is submitted. We'll issue an opinion in due course. Uh, the court is now going to step off the bench um, and take off our robes, and then we're going to come back out and spend some time with the students. Um, but before we step off, I just want to ask everybody please to join me in thanking the lawyers for coming on this field trip with us today. Thank you, counsel. <laughs>
There's too many people to thank individually. I'll thank a few groups of people uh, who are here today. And when I uh, mention the group you're in, please raise your hand so the students know where you are. And I also thank some individuals here today uh, as well. So first of all, we have members here today from the St. Paul Board of Education. And could you uh, raise your hands and uh, let folks know where you are? They're right down here. It's not easy to run a school system and to make sure that everything you have is paid for. So thank you to you. We also have some administrators here who, are, who report to the school board and who are in charge of administering the school system uh, so it works smoothly and everyone does their job. And if you're a St. Paul School District administrator, to, uh, could you raise your hand as well? We've got some around the room. Thank you. Uh, we also have some important court officials here today. We have Don Torgerson, the Deputy State Court Administrator, who is here, right in the front row. Uh, the Ramsey County Court System doesn't operate smoothly and can't run smoothly without the District Administrator, Heather Kendall, is here today. Thank you. And then there's some people here at Humboldt who have worked very hard to make this possible today. And of course, you have uh, Mr. Sadumka, your principal, who is out here today. Uh, Lauren Raconan, the chair of the planning committee. Are you around to wave or she's still working hard? There she is. Uh, we have members of the planning committee. Kevin Burns, St. Paul Public Schools, director of communications. We have teachers James Garofalo, we have Mandy Vuxen, we have Frank Sanani, uh, Matt Osborne, Karen Latcher, Jeremy Durson, Court Baumgart, Dave Gundale, and Katie Craven. Uh, teachers, are you here? If you're here, stand if I get, you said your names. Your auditorium was turned into a courtroom today. That's not an everyday occurrence. Frank Gomez is the chief engineer here, and I want to thank you for turning the auditorium into a courtroom today. All the justices and myself had student escorts today, so thank you, students, for serving as our hosts. The attorneys who helped prepare students for today's program came to classes and, and helped get you thinking about the case, uh, the attorneys today who argued the case. We also had members of the Humboldt Junior ROTC present the colors today. Didn't they do a great job? <laughs> members of the St. Paul Police Department and State Highway Patrol provided security today. The St. Paul Public Schools and St. Paul Neighborhood Network broadcasted, taped, and produced this morning's event. And to you, the students, who obeyed all the rules of decorum and did a fantastic job listening to today's arguments. In a moment, the justices are going to be here. You're going to be able to ask questions. But uh, the rules of decorum and ethics still continue in place. What that means is that you can ask questions, but you're not going to be able to ask questions about this case because the justices have taken this case under advisement. That means they have to treat both sides fairly, and you can't put them in the position of uh, asking questions about this case because the parties might feel that the justices aren't being fair about them. So I'd ask you not to ask a question about this specific case, but there's lots of questions that you could ask the justices. You could ask them questions about cases generally. Uh, what's an effective argument generally? Um, what's it like to be a justice? Questions about the law that you've been wondering about. Uh, so there's a wide variety of questions that you can ask, and uh, the justices, of course, look forward to having a chance uh, to, uh, for you to ask those questions. You see a microphone right here in front of the stage? That's your microphone, so if you have a question, Come on up, stand in line, and the Chief Justice will call on you to ask a question. 
Um, so now I'd like to welcome the justices of the Minnesota Supreme Court back onto the stage for a chance to interact with you. Thank you. Thanks, Coach. Okay. Well, thanks to Humboldt High School for having us. You guys have been great so far. We're going to just briefly introduce ourselves to you, and then we hope you have some questions for us. I'm Lori Gilday. I'm the Chief Justice. I've been the Chief Justice since July of 2010, and I've been on the court since 2006. Justice Anderson. Um, thank you. Delighted to be here. Shout out to St. Paul Neighborhood Network that provided our live stream today. Um, my name is Barry Anderson. Uh, I am uh, the Senior Associate Justice on the court. That's a non-existent title. What it means is uh, I've been the long I'm the longest serving member of the court. I've been a member of the court since 2004 graduate of Gustavus Adolphus College, University of Minnesota Law School, and I spent 20 years practicing law in Greater Minnesota. My name is David Lillehaug. I've been on the court since 2013, so about, just about six years. I grew up in South Dakota, went to Augustana College, and then graduated from Harvard Law School. Practiced law for about 25 years, including as United States Attorney for Minnesota, the Chief Federal Prosecutor. My name is Natalie Hudson. Um, I'm originally from Missouri. Uh, but grew up primarily here. I went to uh, Arizona State University. I came home and went to the University of Minnesota Law School. I practiced law for about 20 years, primarily in the public sector, including uh, two years as a St. Paul City Attorney. I was on the Court of Appeals for 13 years, and I've been here on the Supreme Court uh, since the end of 2015. Hi, I'm Margaret Chudich. I grew up in Anoka, Minnesota. I've been on the court three years. I just won an election in the fall, so I have a six-year term now. Uh, I went to school, I graduated from the University of Minnesota, went to law school at the University of Michigan. My name's Ann McCaig. I am from Federal Dam, Minnesota, up on the Leech Lake Reservation, population 106. Um, I joined the court in 2006. Prior to that, I was a district court judge in Hennepin County. Prior to that, I was an assistant county attorney working on child protection matters, and I am the first Native American on a Supreme Court in the United States. Uh, I'm Paul Thiessen. I'm the newest member of the court. I've been on for just about a year, uh, and uh, I grew up in Bloomington. My dad was actually a teacher and counselor in St. Paul schools for almost 40 years uh, during his career at Highland and other places, so sorry about that. But, um, and uh, I, sir, I worked as a lawyer and I also served in the legislature for 16 years before I was appointed to the court. Okay, so that's about us. Now, if you have questions for us, please step up to the microphone uh, and uh, ask your questions. Um, so, I heard a rumor that someone on this side of the panel plays the flute. <laughs> Justice Lilhog plays the flute. Yes. Which, which one? This one, right here. Oh, there you go. Yes. <laughs> and, he, and he plays it really well. In fact, he and I, I'm just going to tell you this story while we're waiting for someone else to come up to the microphone. Um, for our law clerks a few years ago, Justice Lilhog and I did a duet. Uh, he played the flute and I played the ukulele, and his part was better than mine. Next. Question. Come on up. Come on up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, hello. Um, uh, my question is um, basically about uh, how uh, how much do you take eyewitnesses into account? Uh, is like that's mainly my question. Is, yeah. So the question is, how do we, uh, how do we evaluate eyewitness testimony? Uh, we, are a, an, we are an appellate court, which means we don't have live testimony from witnesses. What we have is a record of the proceedings below, which would be at the district court level, occasionally at the Court of Appeals, if we're looking at the Court of Appeals opinion. So we do get testimony about what eyewitnesses observed, and we take that into account along with all the other evidence that we have. There is a debate about the accuracy of eyewitness testimony, and um, I, I'm, this is not the place or the time to go into all of the details about it, but the credibility of the evidence that we have to evaluate is something that the lawyers engage in at trial. They cross-examine witnesses, uh, try to show either that the eyewitness testimony is accurate 
or that there might be reasons why it is inaccurate. And the jury, in a, in a criminal case, then evaluates whether, uh, who they believe and why they believe it. Um, eyewitness testimony is important. It's not the only evidence that we have. Next question. So the decisions that you make on the Supreme Court have legal effects for like years afterwards. How does that weigh into your decision-making process? Well, it's a big deal because we're not just deciding an individual case, but as you heard today, we're looking to determine what is the rule of law that's going to be the rule in Minnesota, not just for this case, but for many other cases. I remember the first case that I sat on uh, as a justice, um, I, it was really struck me that I was gonna be deciding a case not just for today, not just for tomorrow, but that lawyers maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, maybe even a century, would be looking at one of my opinions and deciding whether they thought it was a sensible rule of law and whether it was well written. And I remembered that because when I was a lawyer, I would cite Minnesota Supreme Court cases from 1875, 1902. If it's good law then and it's good law now, it hasn't been overruled by the legislature, that's the rule of law that will be in Minnesota for a long, long time. This is a question that I would like to hear a response from all of you, for, and that is, what were your initial inspirations for getting for going into law? So we take turns, and it's Justice Hudson's turn. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, my initial inspiration was actually a cousin. Uh, when I was in college, uh, he had just entered uh, law school, and. I was frequently talking with him about what he was studying and what he wanted to do when he got ready to practice, and suddenly I was just fascinated by that. I had initially wanted to be a social worker, and, uh, but when I was talking with him about the law and I saw what impact the law had on people's lives, um, and I thought, wow, it would be fascinating and, and a privilege, really, to be a part of that, to represent clients, to make a difference in, in, in people's lives. And so that's what drew me to the law initially. Uh, so the law has a lot of interpretation to it, obviously. There's a lot of, like, reasonably this, reasonably that. So how do you go about determining what is reasonable? That is a great question. And it's amazing how many times uh, we usually agree on what's reasonable, but we often have differences of opinion on what's reasonable. But as you heard today, we look at uh, our past cases, sometimes give us guideposts about how to interpret reasonableness. And then you know, we look at the facts of the case. And depending on the case, like here, we're supposed to take the facts in the light most favorable to upholding the verdict. So that you know, affects how we view things as well. But that's a, that's a, a big issue in our cases. So how do you deal with stress and um, during the job here? Well, that's a great question for me. <laughs> I, uh, I go home and yell at my children. No, <laughs> no actually, um, <laughs> I, I do yell at them sometimes. But I would say that actually my kids are probably the best relief because you leave a stressful job and you go home and your mom and it just kind of changes into that and there's no greater joy for me than being around my kids. Good question. How do you, um, what, what inspired you to have a, how did you to become a justice? Um, well, it, it actually wasn't something that I was thinking really of doing uh, for most of my career. You know, I was a lawyer and again in the legislature. Uh, but the thing that inspires me, the thing that I like most about it and I find the most, well, two things. One, and I'm going to suck up a little here, but I work with some really great people, and, uh, and it's, a, it's a really collegial, great group of people to work with, and I like that. But the other thing that I like most of all that's different than my legal practice in the legislature is I actually have time to think about stuff. You know, most jobs in life, you're kind of just always reacting to things, and here you actually get to sit and think, what is the right answer here? And, and that I find really, uh, I find just awesome. Next question. In a sense, this is your uh, kind of profession. What are the best kind of arguments like you guys face? Do you want to take that, Justin? So the question is, what are the best kinds of arguments? The best kinds of arguments are the ones that answer the questions that we've asked. Uh, <laughs> that sounds kind of like, well, of course they would answer the question. But you know, candidly, 
that is frequently a problem. Um, you know, we're in the business of dealing with some really tough issues, and so we need help from the lawyers. I mean, it's an adversary process, and it's built on the premise um, that with a frank exchange of views between the two sides, that's going to sharpen the argument, and we're going to have a better chance of answering some really difficult questions. So I would say it applies to those of you who may someday be lawyers and appear before judges, but it also applies to those of you who are in the business of persuasion. Answer the question. Next question. Uh, something I want to know is that, do you guys have any regrets with making these decisions that you guys do? asking if, if there's a decision we've made that you regret. Do you have any regrets about any decisions with the court? Yeah, my, my bad. Well, no, well, uh, no. <laughs> no, um, there are some cases that I look back on, and I've sat on about 600 cases now, and I think, boy, that one could have gone the other way. Um, but I, I can't think of any where I say, boy, I wish I'd voted the other way. And that's part of one of the, the functions of the job, which is you decide the case in front of you, and then you don't anguish about it too much. You move on to the next one, apply your time and energy to the future of the law of the state of Minnesota. Next question. How do you guys feel when, um, like, like when you have the power to uh, put someone in prison for like 10, 20, or 30 years? You know, part of a job of being a judge is you, you have to make decisions, and sometimes they're hard decisions. And um, you, you judge the case on its merits, and um, you follow the law. Uh, the, the legislature determines what, in a criminal matter, what the length of the prison sentence will be. I don't think that it's ever easy, but again, I would go back to something that Justice Anderson said. Again, we're an appellate court, so we're not like at the trial court level where you're actually literally sentencing someone to prison. We're either affirming or you know, agreeing with what the trial court did or reversing that. And um, so you have to follow the law. Um, sometimes you do look at the length of the sentence and you, you might feel badly about that, uh, depending on what the facts are. But it's, it's a part of the job, and you, you simply have to, to be okay with that and, and recognize that, it, that what your job is is to follow the law, and the law has already been established for what that sentence will be in a criminal matter. Next question. You're good. Come on. Okay. So... Um, there's a lot of information uh, to process in a case, so I was wondering, like, how you guys like take it in? Do you like, do you remember some things or, that are significant, or like, do you guys remember it all, or do you guys like just like fade out? Like? Well, we remember it all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, we do a lot of reading. Um, we have um, sitting. Uh, out there are our law clerks who are their lawyers who have just graduated from law school, very bright, very eager. They help us remember a lot of things. They write memos for the court that highlights some of the key facts and that. But we really try hard. We do a lot of reading. We make notes. Uh, we, we write down key points. Um, but that's, a, that's a, a really important part of our job to focus on what's, what's key. What is your take on mandatory minimums? So I'll take that question. He's asking what is our take on mandatory minimums? And the legislature of the state of Minnesota, the politically elected, one of the politically elected branches of government makes those decisions about what a mandatory minimum is. And the judiciary's job is not to question the wisdom of those policy judgments made by the legislature. The judiciary's job is to apply the law as written by the legislature. So that's kind of a long way of my telling you that we're not gonna answer that question. <laughs> Thank you, though. Next question. Um, I got a qu couple questions, is that okay? Sure, go ahead. Um, uh, um, so, so when you guys become judges, do you have to take an oath to uphold and protect the Constitution of the United States of America? Yes. <laughs> um. All right. 
So, so like, would you guys consider yourself patriots? Also, like, like you just love your country, you know, and you wouldn't. Absolutely, I don't think there's a single one of us up here who doesn't love our country. All right. Uh, my question is, uh, well, obviously one of the lawyers presented um, uh, facts in terms of uh, physics of how something might have happened. So obviously that's taken into consideration, but um, how, how, how important is that um, when, you, when, in terms of when you hear what other people say, how people saw it, but also considering um, physics and what actually happens, how, how much consideration goes into it? that and making a decision. Sure. Yeah, so um, the, the facts that the lawyer, well, I'll give two quick answers. First, the facts that the lawyers present at trial and then bring to us and how they interpret it, including scientific evidence. You know, you probably watch CSI and that kind of stuff. I mean, that, that's really important, important to our legal system right now. So we do take that seriously. Um, and then kind of the larger question, when the lawyers come and argue before us, you know, so the process is we get the briefs, the written stuff in advance, but then they'll come and make the arguments. And they're, one of the things I've learned and kind of my, because I'm new here, uh, is that the oral arguments, so these arguments where they come and talk to us are really, really important um, because we get to actually ask questions that we don't know the answer to, right? And they can fill in the gap. Uh, so what you saw here today uh, is really one of, in my mind, maybe the most critical part of the whole case uh, because you, you get to fill in questions that you have. And also, when you hear someone making an argument, kind of talking to you, as opposed to having it written on paper, I think it's more powerful, in a sense, because they can focus in on what they think is important. And you can also read their body language, in a sense, of what they're passionate about, right? And so I think that uh, what you saw here today really is the most critical thing. And, and just so people know, what's going to happen next is we're going to go back uh, up to the Capitol, and will the seven of us get in a room and we're going to vote on how this case comes out. You know, so this is really the last stop on the path. All right. Thank you all very much. You've been a great audience. I'm going to turn everything back over to the principal now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. If we could give the Supreme Court a round of applause. And at this time, I'm going to excuse open world learning. Can be heading back. Humboldt students, just hang out here for a sec. <laughs>